It's a, a great pleasure uh, to have you with us here today. John, you've been here all week at our, our meeting in Hawaii, and uh, uh, I, it just uh, gives us a great opportunity uh, to spend some time with the person who the world recognizes as one of the key players in the lithium-ion battery, which of course is a, a battery that has changed the lives, it changed the world. But before we talk about the battery, I'd like to uh, take a step way back uh, into, your, into your child and, and start talking about what, what got you there, influences in your life and, and uh, just things that occurred uh, that took you on this scientific path. My family moved to New Haven, Connecticut when I was about one year old. My father took a position as a professor of comparative religion at Yale University. And uh, during the 1920s, my grandfather was making a little bit of money in real estate in New York, and so my father had learned to live a lifestyle to which he liked to become accustomed, and he bought a nice five-acre pl plot about eight miles out of the center of the city. So I had the advantage of being brought up in the country, which was important for me. Yeah, and. Uh, so when I was about 11 years old, I remember taking my bicycle down to uh, school, which was eight miles down in the, in the city, and I was driving, by cycling, bicycling back, and I thought to myself, you know, these people who are brought up in the city, they don't seem to understand a lot of things that we understand who've been brought up in the country. As a child, I had dyslexia. So I was so frustrated, I couldn't read. And of course, my older brother could read very well, and my father was a, had been a professor of English and so on with a lot of books to be read, and I just couldn't read. It was terrible. So I related to nature, and so I think that was a very important formation for me to uh, really feel a, a, a bond with nature. When I was 11, my father arranged for me to uh, get a scholarship at a boarding school, which was a six-year boarding school, an Episcopalian school. My father himself was an agnostic. He'd struggled his early life and finally rejected his religious background and became Freudian-oriented. But uh, I was somewhat independent because my interactions with my parents were a little bit limited. So uh, I had to depend, develop a certain independence. And I had, uh, in New Haven, I don't have any very happy memories of that period. But when I left home at 12, my life changed, and it was a wonderful thing for me to get away from home. Where was the uh, school that you attended? The school was Groton School, which is in Massachusetts, an Episcopalian school. And my father had, uh, <clears throat> had students that were his at Yale who had come from the school, and he realized they'd gotten a good, pretty good training. And uh, so I went there, and it was, uh, of course, a school that uh, catered to fairly wealthy Hamlet families. From, they were all of the blue bloods of the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And um, I enjoyed suddenly being cast into this area which first gave structure to my life because it was a school which lived by the bells and you were structured. But also it was, uh, had an aristocratic feel. Of, when I say aristocratic, I mean an arist aristocracy of the spirit that was there that I responded to very much. And so uh, that was a great experience for me. So when I arrived at the school, I was in the very bottom with the dummies. I had a very good English teacher who taught me all the English I needed to know. And then I ended up being in the top 
group of the schools. So the first assignment was to write a, a critique on Shakespeare's sonnet, Let Me Not to the Marriage of True Minds Admit Impediments. And so I struggled. And when I got my paper back, on the bottom of the paper was written, this assignment was too much for you, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I knew I was going to have to work hard in that class. And it taught me a good deal. And I'd also been struggling with the fact that I had loved singing in the choir my freshman year, first year there, because at age 12 my voice hadn't changed yet and they were desperate for somebody who could sing soprano. It was not that I was a good singer. <laughs> but I, I enjoyed very much singing in the choir and so I had a struggle to try to understand what the symbolism was all about. Mm -hmm. I, you know, if you don't understand metaphor and you don't understand parable, you, you miss the point. And um, mm -hmm. so I uh, got myself baptized. And then the next year I got myself confirmed, mm -hmm. hoping that I would find out what it was all about. And so at the Easter holiday of the course I was taking in, 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 uh, in poetry, I came home to my father and I said, I'm having a terrible time understanding what they mean by God. Mm -hmm. Can you help me to understand it? Well, he is a, a historian of his of religion and a, and a Freudian brought out all these pictures from Mesopotamia and various other places all over the world of their, their depictions of God. And I went to bed to sleep that night and um, these pictures came up in my dream before me. And every time I said, well, that's not God, that's nothing. And uh, uh, one of the poems I had read that was, had haunted me was a poem called The Hound of Heaven. And so at some point, the head of a hound dog came up and I said, no, that's not God. And the hound dog opened his mouth and smiled at me because I had had a dog and mm -hmm. I relate to animals. But deep in beneath the, the smile, there was this warm glow and suddenly it occurred to me, God is love. And I jumped out of bed and I was so excited and it changed my life. I've been changed by that ever since. One of the things we like to do is, is get you to re reflect on those early years and, and it seems like uh, uh, the people we speak to have such a similar story in that there's uh, this rich uh, diversity of experiences but also the, the resilience you know comes through and, and the things that you faced the, the challenges the academic challenges the family challenges how it uh, how it built you as a person and, and set you on to the next stages of your life and and so let's talk about Yale talk about Yale all right well, my dad gave me $35 so that I could buy my books when I first went to Yale. And uh, I had wanted to play football very much and I went out and on the third day on the gridiron, my uh, coach came up and said, John, I'm sorry, but you have a scholarship and you work 21 hours a week in order to get your meals. And you can't play football and work 21 hours a week and keep a scholarship. So you're gonna to have to give something up. So that was the end of my dreams of being a football hero. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, the first year I worked in a suit pressing firm and the rest of the other year, years I, 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 graded, I was a grader. And so it gave me, it gave me uh, 21 meals a week during term. But when we had a holiday, I had to find out how I was going to have enough money to eat. <laughs> Fortunately, my roommate's mother was a very nice woman and she would invite me home for at least one week of a, of a holiday. And uh, so 
I never had any money, but I never lacked for anything during my time. Mm -hmm. So I uh, can't complain. And uh, so I lived like all the rich boys, except I didn't drink as they have drank, and I didn't buy superfluous things as <laughs> they might buy, and I didn't take trips to New York to, as, as they would do. And I couldn't have a date, but otherwise it was okay. <laughs> so I didn't lack anything, but I didn't have anything extra. You were a math student, and uh, were there uh, were there faculty that had a lot of influence on some of the next things you did with well, your life? Well, let me say about influence. First of all, the headmaster of my school, I had figured out that he, unbeknownst to me at the time, had arranged for me first to be a tutor for his grandchildren the summer before I went to Yale, and then the next year to be a tutor with some a lawyer family out in, in, in uh, or a banker family out in uh, Wheaton, Illinois. And that enabled me to get my room paid for. Yeah. So, and then I had a professor who was not a, a, a fancy theorist, theor a theorist at all, was a mathematics professor, but he enjoyed students but he, he never got promoted to be a full professor, but he was, had influence on students. And of course, it was in my sophomore year that Pearl Harbor came along mm -hmm. and it was time for us to enlist. And I was on my way to enlist Why he called me into an off his office and said, John, if, if I were you, I wouldn't volunteer for the Marines like all your friends. He said, what they need is some people who know some mathematics to do meteorology. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's not a bad idea. Right. So <laughs> <laughs> I signed up to do meteorology. And uh, then that gave me another year before they called me up. Right. And so as a result, I, was, I had three full years to finish my undergraduate degree at Yale. And uh, I lacked just one course, and they gave me credit for my meteorology course for that one thing and allowed me to graduate. So. Yeah, so you, you finished in three years, and, and now you're in the service. Yeah. Uh, so, so what happens next? <laughs> well, <laughs> well uh, you know, I had struggled while I was at Yale. Um, what I was going to do, you know, all the young people, they have to struggle. Who are they and what are they going to do? And if you, my friends were all going into the dad business or something like that, and they were making contacts for this, that, or the other, and I wasn't. And so, and uh, I was sitting in a chair in my study reading Whitehead's uh, Science in the Modern World. And while I sat there, suddenly I had this impression that came to me and said, I'm sorry, but if, you, if I, you ever get a chance to come back to graduate school after you return from the Army, you should study physics. <laughs> so that's how I got involved in science, because in graduate, um, it, at Yale, you were sort of a smorgasbord of things you, you look at with the finishing school the first few years. And, and uh, my science was the first year of chemistry <laughs> to get my scientific mm -hmm. requirement out of the way. <laughs> then I had a course in physics. And, and uh, in fact, I had two courses in physics, actually. It was good. And I, did, and I did mathematics because it was much easier for me as a poor reader to study philosophy than it was to study English or history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> so I did languages and I did, so you see, I had six years of Latin and four years of Greek. <laughs> oh, good stuff. <laughs> when I, well, the war was over and I was waiting for my time to go home, why, um, there was someone, 
I think his name is Gary Powers, but not the one who got shot down over Russia, <laughs> who said, I renounce my American citizenship to become a citizen of the world. And I resonated very much to that sentiment at that time. And I thought, well, maybe I should be a, a, go back to law school and become an international lawyer, you see, so, which would have been a disaster if I had done it, fortunately. It was just one of those things that I got saved from over my life of wrong decisions that could have been made. <laughs> and and uh, I got a telegram from uh, the White House saying, report back to Washington, D.C. in 48 hours. So I packed my donage and went back and they said, well, you're supposed to uh, be in Chicago and you've been chosen of one of 21 to uh, have a, to your, keep your position in grade and uh, go to school and study either physics or mathematics. Well, I then had the flashback to sitting in the chair reading Whitehead and I knew that I was uh, really not gifted for either mathematics or theoretical physics. <laughs> and so I, but I said, but I believe this is what I'm supposed to do. I felt that I had a calling. So mm -hmm. I signed up and old Professor Simpson at Chicago was the registration officer and he said, I don't understand you veterans. Don't you know that anybody who'd ever done anything interesting in physics had done it by the time he was your age oh. and you want to begin? <laughs> And I said, well, he's right. I'm not good character, but I believe physics is rather fundamental to science, and this is what I think I'm supposed to do. To have suddenly be called back to give the opportunity to go to graduate school mm -hmm. was a miracle. Mm -hmm. Let's face it. I mean, uh, there I was. I had nothing to go back to. Everybody had forgotten who you were by the time you get back, and right. everybody's scrambling, and you have to begin all over again. And uh, it took me two years more of struggling with the issues that I was struggling with in, 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 in before I left of who I was and mm -hmm. what I was to serve in life before I got back to normal. And, my, and I was not in the foxhole. Yeah. And so I have a great deal of sympathy for the people who are coming back from spending a few years in the Army. It's not that there's anything wrong with the Army, but the transition from army life to civilian life is a very difficult one. Right. Uh, so, well, a door swung open and you went to University of Chicago, right? And you said it was... A, and I went to the University of Chicago yeah. and uh, I struggled to get through, but I managed. Mm -hmm. And my professor, I was running out of funds because I had decided to leave the program that they'd done because they wanted me to commit myself to the army for life and so on. And I knew I didn't want that. And, I'd been asked if I wanted to stay in the Army and do meteorology, and I said, no. My professor, well, I'll say something about the old school that you had at Chicago at the time. You see, Fermi was old school. They didn't give the, the normal teaching course. The student was expected to go to the library and teach himself, and the professors merely lectured on what they felt like that was interesting to them. They didn't have tutors to supplement anything to tell you what was important, but they did have a 32-hour examination at the end of the year <laughs> to, to see whether you could go on to graduate school or not. And so you were supposed to know the entire field of physics and pertinent topics in mathematics and chemistry. And it was eight hours a day for four days in a row. Wow. And, uh, I had to take the foolish examination twice. It was a, <laughs> I wasn't that clever that I could breathe through it the first time. <laughs> well, you said, uh, what? But, and only 10% survived, but only 10 right? 10% got through, yeah. as you can see. That yeah. was a pretty good filtering system. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and um, then they had a rule there that I think it would be interesting for the students to know, I think, because Fermi thought quite correctly that the PhD should be a research degree. And therefore, the student should have been able to demonstrate that he could not only solve a problem, but he could also find a problem to solve that was his own. Mm -hmm. So I went to my professor, Clarence Zener, because he was the only one doing solid state, and I knew I didn't want to do nuclear physics. 
And um, so when I went in, he said, well, now, John, I'll take you as my student, but you have two problems. The first problem is to find the problem, and the second problem is to solve it. Good day. <laughs> but actually, he was a, a pretty good professor, and he had a bag lunch uh, every week and asked one of his students to take a, a topic and give a lecture on the topic. Mm -hmm. And at the end of my first presentation, well, he called me into his office. He said, well, that's fine, John. Now, did you find a topic in that area? Well, then I knew what his game was. And so, so the next time I found a topic, but it was too easy. And the th third time I found a topic and it was too hard. And the fourth time I found a topic and it, I was able to solve it. <laughs> And he went down to Westinghouse my last year and invited us to go and that I was going to be paid to, as, a, as a Westinghouse engineer. And that allowed me to get married. You see, I had met my wife while I was at Chicago and then wow. she'd gone back to uh, teach school in order to be able to pay back her father for his loaning to her to go mm -hmm. be able to go to school. So uh, we waited for a couple of years. And, then we had a wonderful marriage for 65 years. And she died in January from Alzheimer's. And uh, so those were the principal things, except at the end of my time when I passed in my thesis, I had a rather simple thesis in which I was trying to study the <coughs> interaction between the Fermi surface and the Brillouin's own surface explain why the hexagonal alloys change their C over A ratio as a function of the electron atom ratio. And I went up to give my presentation. I'd been away for the year, and the head of the department was there to hear what I had to say at my 10-minute presentation. And uh, when I got finished, there was a little old man in his 90s who stood up and said, well, that's fine, young man. But you know, that's not the first Brillouin zone of the hexagonal closed pack lattice. Well, I went back devastated, thinking <laughs> I lost everything on my thesis. But my professor said, now, John, you go back and think about it over the weekend. So I went back and thought about it over the weekend, and I was able to show that. Brillouin was mathematically correct, but scientifically wrong that there was no energy discontinuity at the Brillouin's own boundary that I had left out. And so I managed to somehow get a degree. <laughs> Let's get to the next step at well, Lincoln Lab. Well, the next Lab. step was when I got through, my last few months while finishing my dissertation at Westinghouse, Zener was always a man full of ideas. He came down one day and said, I've got a new idea. I'm going to use nickel oxide and we're going to do thermoelectric power and we're going to use thermoelectric power to do all the air conditioning and it'd be just marvelous, you see. So I was supposed to take a look at this problem and uh, after I looked at it for a couple of weeks, I said, Sir, I'm afraid you're not going to get around the vitamin franz ratio. You're going to be stuck with that. He said, well, he, he didn't say anything but assumed that I was not his best student, which, of course, I wasn't. And so he said, I think you better find a job when you finish your thesis. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I wasn't ready to be a professor, so I took a job at the MIT Lincoln Laboratory mm -hmm. with engineers. And uh, I felt comfortable, again, one of these funny things where right. you had three things to choose, but somehow in my spirit I felt this is where I should go. It wasn't the most glamorous job I could do. And when I was, went there, the, M the Lincoln Laboratory had been assigned the job of the semi-automatic ground environment system, which simply was 
for the Air Force, how are they going to defend themselves against the air breathing threat from the Russians because we were in the Cold War by that time. Yeah. And uh, one of the components of the system was a digital computer. And at the time, there was no memory for the digital computer. Mm -hmm. And Jay Forrester had had the idea of the ROM memory that he was going to do using the square hysteresis loop in Deltavax or one of these other alloys that make the square hysteresis loop by rolling tapes very thin. As an electrical engineer, when he found that he couldn't get the speed that he wanted, he thought it must be eddy currents. So he kept rolling them thinner and thinner. And finally, he decided, well, I better use an insulating magnet. And they had, during the war, people had developed the ferrite magnetic spinels. So that's how I got introduced into transition metal oxides, because when I arrived there, my job was to develop a square hysteresis loop in a ceramic. And of course, all the magneticians laughed up their sleeves and said, that's an impossible job because you can't roll the ceramic. <laughs> <laughs> but we managed within three years to solve the problem, mm -hmm. and I learned a lot of physics and chemistry along the way, solid state chemistry along the way, and uh, really got me started. And we got called back to Jay Forrester's office, and we thought, well, maybe we're going to get a raise because we solved this problem. And we got there and he said, well, I appreciate you fellows doing a good job. Now that you've worked yourself out of a job, what are you planning to do? <laughs> so I had to go home for the weekend and decide what, what was my next step. That was a very good lesson to learn. So uh, as a result, two years later, the project I decided to do, somebody said, I want to become famous, John. Let me take your, your, your program for you. I knew he was a better experimentalist than I. I said, yeah, you can have it done, and I'll take over what's left of the ceramics laboratory. And that's what led me to having the opportunity to use chemists to study physics problems in transition metal oxides. Well, I'd like to know more about the impact of that work. Well, the impact of that work is, you know, fundamental science is very important. And first of all, out of it, I had developed the idea of orbital ordering on transitional metal oxide that had an orbital degeneracy of the d electrons. It's now called a cooperative Jan Teller distortion because Jan and Teller had developed from symmetry arguments that there should be a structural change if, to remove an orbital degeneracy in a molecule. But nobody had applied the idea to the to solids and why you got certain phase changes, uh, st structural changes in solids. But we use that idea to use, take advantage, I did to, to take advantage of a dynamic Jan Teller effect where you didn't quite have enough of the Jan Teller ions to make it go to tra long range to track and room temperature. And uh, I could develop chemical inhomogeneities, which gave me just the uh, impurity that I needed in order to uh, nucleate the domain of reverse magnetization and have them to grow free. And so that gave me the solution to the problem we had. And I could prove it by going from manganese three to copper two. And so we could do it either way and it worked fine. But also, I just want to emphasize the importance of the fundamental studies, because I said after we did that and I was able to take over, I had almost 10 years to do fundamental science on the electronic properties of the D electrons in transition metal oxides. And uh, uh, during that period, I had 
develop the rules for the super exchange interaction to tell you where you're going to get ferromagnetism, where you're going to get anti-ferromagnetism. I, I um, uh, explored the transition from localized to itinerant electron behavior, which is where, where charge density waves came out and where the high temperature superconductors normally eventually came out and so on. So, and also I had explored layered oxides. So that is sort of a background for what I would use for the lithium ion battery later on. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. You were there 14 years uh, and you've already got uh, a lot of uh, accomplishments, a lot of work uh, done in that time. Uh, from there, you're now going to join the faculty, University of Oxford. Are we ready to go there? Well, yeah, before I, I go there, let's say that, of course, is another stunning happenstance. How'd that happen? <laughs> another happened. Well, there had the Welch Foundation program, the Welch Foundation in, in, in Texas. Mm -hmm. No, it, yeah. Yeah, and so I was invited to make a presentation at one of their seminars, and the man that was the professor of inorganic chemistry at Oxford happened to be the chair of that particular session. Wow. <laughs> and so we made, a, he liked my presentation and he liked what I had mm -hmm. to say apparently. And um, I've got to go back, but before then, or just before I went to Oxford, I had uh, been told by the Mansfield Amendment, you know, the people in Congress decide they know how to do everything, and so I was told I couldn't continue my work on fundamental science because it wasn't geared or targeted to an Air Force uh, problem. And so I had to change what I was doing, even though it was just going along very well. And um, the energy crisis came in at about the same time. Now this is really a preliminary to the whole business of the batteries and how the lithium ion batteries came about. You see, in the 1960s, there were two men, one in, France by the name of Jean Ruxel, and one in Germany by the name of Robert Schulhorn. And they were exploring the intercalation of lithium, reversible intercalation into layered sulfides. Okay. And in 1967, the Ford Motor Company had done a little bit of basic research and they had discovered in beta alumina a ceramic which gave a pretty good conductivity of the sodium plus ions. All right? Mm -hmm. And so they turned the battery business inside out by saying, we will use, instead of a liquid electrolyte, we'll use a solid electrolyte and we'll use liquid electrodes. And we he made the sodium sulfur battery but it operated around 350 degrees centigrade in order to be able to get the rates that they needed and so on. And that battery has been commercialized once in Japan, but it's too expensive to maintain at those temperatures. Mm -hmm. And so the, that program was stopped. But I had been introduced because of my background in transition metal oxides, to monitor that program from the point of view of the ceramics. And I had gone, been invited to give some lectures at Stanford and was being sent around from one fiefdom to the next to the different professors mm -hmm. in Stanford. And uh, Bob Huggins was working on the sodium beta alumina battery, the sodium sulfur battery, and he said, John, how would you design a sodium ion conductor? Because at that point, suddenly, the electrochemicals people had become interested in 
ionic transport in solids, yeah. all right? Well, I told him that I, you know, I've just given you a lecture on the perovskites, and uh, I know about the hexagonal tungsten bronze things with tunnels with hexagonal rims around, and the sodium, I'm sure, will go very nicely up and down those tunnels. And I said, I would make a material where I had tunnels like that that intersected so that it was not one-dimensional conductivity, but I had two or three-dimensional conductivity. And he said, well, that's fine, John, but we have sodium bead alumina, so thank you. And so on my way home, I said, well, I don't like that response. I'm sure that this sodium bead alumina has got tunnels in two directions, and I looked, and indeed it did. So I tried to find out how I could get tunnels in three directions so that I could have three-dimensional conductivity instead of two-dimensional conductivity. Well, we tried to do a variety of things, and finally, uh, uh, we, uh, I, got, I said, what we need to do, we've tried only tetrahedral coordination sharing corners, we've tried octahedral sharing corners. Let's take a material which shares tetrahedra and octahedra. And I, Henry Hong was a crystallographer who would come to my lab to work, and I said, and he said, yes, that's a good idea, Professor, or, but then I was not a professor, and said, uh, <laughs> uh, they're making phosphates. Let's take a look at the phosphates. So I said, fine. And I said, what you need is zirconium, because otherwise it won't be an electrolyte. So I said, let's make sodium ZR2PO4 three times. And it was fine. And we got the hexagonal phase, and it was a per fair, but not the best. And I, but we looked at the structure, because he was a crystallographer, and I said, look, what we need to do is add more sodium. And uh, of course, not knowing any better, I said, well, let's put some silicon in, and then we'll get a little bit extra sodium, because we got room for four. And because after all, you can make Na4 Si. It's IO4 th three times. So uh, we did that and we got what was called the Nazicon structure. It was at that point I was invited to go to Oxford. Okay. And, you know, I, knowing I had to leave Lincoln and not knowing where was the best thing to do and having the the naive idea that maybe I could do something in the third world, third world country for them in, in the energy area. I went to Iran and I was invited to go to Iran and raise uh, some money for the Aryan Air University from the Shah. <laughs> <laughs> As I was there waiting to accept their invitation to head that thing, I understood that they were just using me and that was not really what I should do. And I got a letter from Oxford saying, would you please apply for the position as head of the inorganic chemistry laboratory as professor. 19, <laughs> around 1976? That was 1975 Five. that that came. And I thought, well, if these uh, people in Oxford have enough imagination to think I'm a chemist, can become a professor of chemistry, then I better accept. <laughs> so that's how, I, that's how I went to Oxford, where there were people who were doing electrochemistry, and I thought, well, that's good because I can use solid state chemistry, which I know a little bit about, and mm -hmm. I can learn from them about electrochemistry and get educated a little bit more than what I was learning about with the Ford business. And so that's what I did. And wh while I was there, it became clear that the, the layered sulfides weren't going to work. And I had done layered oxides, and so I said, well, how much lithium can I take out before it becomes unstable? And that's how we came up with the lithium cobalt and the lithium nickel layered compounds. Mm -hmm. And. I knew, uh, and I had said we should, we should, uh, we have to prepare a discharge battery, and then you 
put another material for the anode, which will interact with the lithium, and the Japanese and the Bell Telephone people have been looking at the carbons. And uh, there was someone in Japan whose name Yoshimori or something like that who had made the first cell of a lithium ion battery and the Sony, he was interacting with the Sony people and the Sony people licensed the, uh, the discovery and made the first cell telephone and launched the wireless revolution. Mm -hmm. But I was only doing fundamental science. <laughs> but I did patent, but the lawyers at the last minute said, oh no, you have to give us everything in the patent or we won't, oh. we won't do it. So, <laughs> so, so the AERE Harwell people took the billions that oh. that particular patent earned. <laughs> so Sony came along and commercialized the technology in 1991, but you're credited with the original development. Uh, well, you just were talking about uh, how, uh, I guess they, they patent it and, um, and even though your thoughts and ideas are, are behind it, uh, the commercial success went to Sony. Well, I had no idea at the time yeah. of, of right. what the electrical engineers right. would do with it. Right. And so uh, you have to give the electrical engineering people who have taken what we did way back in the 50s and 60s with the digital computer mm -hmm. and reduced it from ballroom size to what you put in your pocket right. in size, but same principles we have mm -hmm. developed. But you, once the transistor came along, you could make it smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. So when the transistors were fast enough, then the, the, the electronics people could take over and follow Moore's law while they learned each year how to make things a little bit smaller. That's right. <laughs> but did you, did you have a an idea that it might have this kind of impact? Could you see something coming? No, no. I wasn't thinking along those lines. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just doing, I knew that it was important, that it, so that's why I patented it. Mm -hmm. But you, you can't visualize right. all of the things that's gonna happen. I wanted to uh, come back to something I started on <laughs> and almost leapfrog some important pieces of this uh, this uh, interview and and that is the uh, the partnership idea the uh, the relationships that you fostered uh, relationships between the different sciences chemists and physics and and uh, other people who contributed uh, to the development uh, of the battery uh, would you share some of your thoughts about that yeah well let me go back to the more general statement of thought behind your, your question, because one of the things I like to think is part of my heritage is that uh, I contributed, I didn't do it alone, of course, but I contributed to the wedding of physics and chemistry mm -hmm. and it brought those things together because solid state chemists were stamp collectors when I began mm -hmm. and uh, the physicists used the chemists to make single crystals or to make their materials for them, but mm -hmm. they weren't thinking about what they could do. And that got transformed by the 10 years I had doing um, research with chemists trying to solve mm -hmm. physics problems. <laughs> and now you come back to your specific question about partnerships in, in you know, we, we are moving inevitably, inexorably, I think is what they would normally use the word, mm -hmm. to uh, where one needs a great deal more interdisciplinarity of the different disciplines. Mm -hmm. And as each discipline has matured, they've, they've come to overlap a little bit, and, and, and so it's easier now to get some interdisciplinarity mm -hmm. between between solid state physics, solid state chemistry, or material science, right. if you like, might like to call it. Whereas the physics uh, people going off to do astronomy <laughs> mm -hmm. have gone in another, another direction mm -hmm. who are doing nuclear physics. Yeah, so, that, that's a, 
uh, your your uh, experience and what you were fostering between the the chemists and the physics, there, there's some similarity to uh, the electrochemical society, and, and there are other electrochemical societies you know all over the world, but uh, we're we're the only one that uh, made this connection back in the 60s, uh, influenced by Bell Laboratories contributing uh, their, the solid state science component to to our journals, and so uh, that that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by that similarity, and and I think uh, you know your work and and people like you know what, well what you were contributing uh, to to our science uh, help you really personally help make those connections for us as well. Well, that's true, but I go back to another thing, which is a sad demise of the Bell Telephone Lab. Oh well. And the reason there is you had in one place. I didn't necessarily like their managing style, but uh, they were very successful because they could attract very bright people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but they were the, one of the first laboratories that brought together the different disciplines. And uh, at Lincoln Lab, in order to solve the problems we had to do, we had to bring physics and chemistry together to solve the problem right. and engineering. So it was those laboratories, and it should be happening more at the national labs, but the national labs, I don't know why they haven't been able to have the same success mm -hmm. that a place like the Lincoln Lab had or that uh, Bell Telephone Laboratories have. But it's something they should be doing. Mm -hmm. It should be doing because there they have the, the opportunity, the money to have the big equipment and they've done a good job in, in getting big instruments that university people can't have access to or can't maintain very well either. And they can come and, and service mm -hmm. the, the wider community. So next step on your path was University of Texas, Austin. Uh, you're the, currently uh, the Virginia H. Cockrell Centennial Chair of, uh, of Engineering at the university. And um, so uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what door swung open that, that led you there and, and what you've done and what you, what you continue to do at the university. Well, again, it's interesting how doors open at some time or another. I was reaching the age of, when I was going to have to retire from University of Oxford and the politics was beginning to begin to percolate around and there was a man by the name of Ernest Cockrell who gave money to the University of Chicago for chairs in, mechan in, in materials engineering. And I mentioned Henry Hong who was a crystallographer I had hired who worked with me on making the Nazicon structure and he had been a student of uh, a professor at the University of Texas and they had wanted me to they wanted to start a material science program at the time I went to Oxford and so I went down and interviewed there and the Dean of Engineering said but he's not an engineer of course, he was right. I was, I'm not a, an engineer, but I was elected to the Academy of Engineering at the same time the dean was. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it just shows uh, how people's mindsets uh, are in a certain way. And he didn't really understand about material science. Right. He was a he was a gung ho engineer. So it's, it's interesting because you see, I went from physics to being a professor of chemistry to being a professor of engineering. <laughs> they tell me the only thing I've got left now is become a professor of theology. <laughs> or English literature. <laughs> anyway, they uh, uh, invited me to um, interview and to take one of these chairs and I was delighted to be able to come back because I wasn't quite sure how I was going to retire at 5,000 pounds a year retirement mm -hmm. from the University of Oxford. So I accepted with great pleasure 
and the University of Texas has treated me extremely well. And when I did you accept the position? Run. I went there in 1986, so I was at, in Oxford only 10 years, and what you do at Oxford is you divide by 80 the number of years you've been in service and, <laughs> <laughs> and multiply that by your salary, and the, that's mm -hmm. why the retirement was rather meager. I see. Okay? So, um, anyway, so at, when I was on my way to Texas in 1986, uh, Bednarts and Mueller were saying they discovered some high, high uh, reasonably high uh, superconductivity transition temperatures and uh, so uh, that was interesting, but I had, didn't have a lab yet, and it took, took me quite a while to get a lab set up. And in the meantime, one of my friends was a crystallographer there, and I said, well, you know, if they'd add a little yttrium and so on, you might forget something interesting. And apparently everybody did it at about the same time, and uh, uh, he was the first one before the, the what do they call it, the something. Uh, one of these rock star meetings in New York when mm -hmm. everybody was reporting on the structure of this 90 Kelvin uh, high temperature superconductivity. So uh, I had a young man come, you'll have to forgive me, I'm not talking always about lithium ion batteries, but uh, I had a young man come, or a, a professor in, in, in Jilin University, he said, I've got a student who had been interested in the work you did back in the Lincoln Lab with high pressure on transition metal oxides, and I would like him to get his PhD with you, but to uh, get his degree from the Jilin University. And I thought, well, that's fine, because then I don't have to have him waste a couple of years taking off the courses and the exams that you need to he can just do the research with me and get his degree from Chilin. And that young man is Yanshi Zhou, who has stayed with me because Tiananmen Square came along while he was with me. And he is the best uh, experimental physicist that I've had mm -hmm. the privilege to work with. And he's built up a high pressure facility. And so we work very much on the transition metal oxides, the fundamental work I was doing at Lincoln has now been taken over and with much better uh, facilities and, and, and experimental technique mm -hmm. than we ever had in the early days. And I've run the, more or less the, uh, the, uh, the chemistry lab. And uh, so we have looked at high I've been interested in, in, the, in the solid oxide fuel cell, and we've been interested in the, the uh, catalysis for the air electrodes, and we've been interested in new, new battery materials. To come a little further uh, closer to home, or to, to the present, uh, about a year and a half ago, I was involved in a, in, in, in a program that I didn't believe was going to work at, when it was as a crystal, crystal structure because I didn't think they could dope it, which they couldn't. And uh, there was a man in the company that, whose name I've forgotten anyway. His name was Andy Murchison, and he became aware of a little lady who left the Argonne National Laboratory, or whatever, not, at Argonne, not Argonne, anyway, one of the national labs, and had gone back to Portugal and said, no, I can make a glass. Hmm. And the glass turns out to have quite extraordinary properties, and they, she was interested in the high dielectric constant of the material. And Andy said, well, you know, I think it would be good if you brought your glass to Professor Goodenough and see what you can do. And so my people were quite convinced, since she had made it by putting water into it, uh, that you could never have anything that used water. And uh, 
So I, my people were completely skeptical of the whole affair, and I said, no, I believe in waiting to see a little bit. And so I finally, as I pointed out in the lecture on, on Sunday, that uh, you lose the water first as HCl and then uh, as OH, two OHs performing O2 and H2O. So it's dry, and we, I was also interested in uh, the fact that with the lithium ion battery, you, the, the, the carbon anode is a problem, and so is the liquid electrolyte. Mm -hmm. Now, we showed you could plate lithium even with a liquid electrolyte if you had small enough pores through which the interaction came. And we've made a potassium battery <laughs> with, with this, with the liquid electrolyte, but nobody's gonna want a flammable liquid on the road or the highway, so I said, we've got to take her glass and see what we can do with the glass. And we demonstrated that you could plate lithium and sodium from the glass. So we, now I think we almost solved the anode problem, but I'm beginning to discover there may be a problem with impedance at the interface, and so we have to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. But if we do, we have a completely new way to make a wow. battery, and wow. uh, I think it will be a big step function and solve the problem. So I'm very optimistic, personally, that uh, the, the battery business will be able to power electric cars that are competitive with the and internal combustion engine. You just continue uh, to keep up the investigation. It's uh, um, Boy, so many things. Your, your work, uh, yeah, I'd like to actually um, just change the, the line of questioning a bit uh, because your work, all the things that you've talked about today has had so much influence on the Electrochemical Society. Uh, and, you know, it, it's so, uh, y your connections and, and the, the influence has, I think, really, you know, advanced uh, the work of so many through the type of organization that we are. And, and that, that advancement is through, well, meetings like this uh, that we're, we're attending and, and in our publications. And so, but the publication business has changed a lot. That's where, you know, the research is shared, and, but that, that's changed in, in a way that I think there's uh, more obstacles and, and, well, the dissemination part isn't as effective as it could be, and, and I think that's, that's detrimental, and, and we're, we're trying to do what we can uh, to uh, get around that or move it forward with an initiative we have going on called Free the Science. Uh, but I'd like you to share some of your thoughts about uh, scientific uh, publications, uh, research publications, and, and what's going on. Well, you see, once you had the, the, the revolution whereby you could get the authors to uh, not only write the papers, but also go into the right format for a particular journal, and then do all the, did, and you send it out to a referee who does his work free, and then you get the authors to do the corrections, and then you uh, finally get it proofread, and everything done for you as an editor, and all you have to do is to have the computer print it out on paper and sell it to all the uh, laboratories in the world. Well, that looks like a nice business model for a lot of people, and there are always people who want to be, have their names as editors of journals, and so the first thing you know, we have this huge proliferation of journals all competing mm -hmm. for who's going to have the highest rating and who's right. going to do what. And I believe it's corrupted the basic uh, situation as far as publications is concerned, especially where in a country like China, the people can't go back and get a, uh, a job unless they've published in a certain journal and have certain number of citations of papers and so on. Whereas, you know, you think back in the days when uh, Thermodynamics was invented. 
and it was published in, in a Connecticut journal. <laughs> So what you really want to do is for, I mean, the, uh, the, the chemical societies essentially are in the business of fostering partnerships. We come back to the word partnerships. Mm -hmm. in, uh, and they're international partnerships, which you do through conferences like the one you have here, right, this time. Uh, that are important for people one-on-one -on -one to meet one another, mm -hmm. for the young people to find jobs and so on, but also through the publications which are archived. And there's a big push for being able to get things out quickly and so on. And so it's important for the, I mean, the, 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 the the scientific societies have been the original backbone of publishing archived things that have been properly refereed and uh, not there for profit, but were there to serve the community at large. And uh, I am very unhappy to see this tendency at the present moment for that whole process to be corrupted. And I wish you well and I appreciate the, uh, the initiative you're doing on making it free. Well, thanks, thanks for sharing that. That's, uh, uh, I appreciate your insights for someone who's been doing it uh, for many years and has uh, contributed such a big piece of the uh, scientific uh, body of knowledge. Um, you know, I think uh, your, your feelings about that are, are very important, uh, and so thank you. Um, I actually want to uh, uh, end this discussion by uh, repeating back to you a quote and just having you uh, comment on about uh, what, when you say you found your own scientific voice, and, and what's the meaning of that? <laughs> well, that's a tr slightly tricky, I suppose. But if you were an artist, right, you would learn technique, but at some point, you have to find your own voice. That is, what is it that you do that is yours? I mean, that is something that... Mm -hmm. And when you're a student and you're learning what other people have done, and even when you're doing your thesis and your writing and so on, you're, there's too much of what I see going on where people are copying. Mm -hmm. They're not developing their own voice. They're not developing their own style of how they move. And I forget who it was, uh, one of the Englishmen who said, style is the ultimate morality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there is a sense in which if you want to be a good scientist or you want to be a good anything, even if it's a dishwasher, you have to develop your own style and you have to do it in the, somehow that represents who you as an individual are. Well, we certainly, all of us, <laughs> everybody in the world who has benefited from your contributions appreciate that you are able to develop your own scientific style and your own voice. So, so thank you for being with us here today. This was uh, a great opportunity to speak with John Goodenough and, and for you to share so much about your life and, and the science that you contributed to. Thank you. Thank you very much.